Institutionality of Executive Action and Immig uh, for Immigration and on Healthcare. He's the adjunct scholar for the Cato Institute. He's the founder and president of the Harlan Institute. And one of my favorite things is he is the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS, which is a you should all play <laughs> fantasy league oh my God. for the Supreme Court. Um, which sounds a lot like our final in Professor Griffin's class. Uh, uh, fantasy or nightmare? Which one was it? <laughs> Uh, and that's a nice segue into Professor Griffin. She is the William S. Boyd Professor of Law, right? That's, that's the, the, the title. She's got the law school title there. Uh, she teaches constitutional law and is known for being an expert in law and religion. She has a doctorate from, I gotta look at my notes every time I try, try not to do this, from Yale in Religious Studies and her law degree from Stanford. Uh, before becoming a professor, she clerked for the Honorable Mary M. Schroeder of the Ninth Circuit and was assistant counsel to the Department of Justice for PU, her professional responsibility. Uh, professor Bartram teaches common law, constitutional theory, and law and religion. He has taught previously at Drake Law School, Vermont Law School, and Yale Law School. His research interests include constitutional history and theory, the Establishment Clause, and constitutional education. Professor Bartram obtained his bachelor's from Hamilton College, his law degree from Vermont Law School, and his LLM from Yale. He's an avid piano player, a proud parent, and he has a pretty good on-base average for the spring fling sophomore game. Um, so with, what, 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 what do you play? Shortstop? No, I'm yeah. no. <laughs> Uh, that's a joke because his, Stephen Kish, who is also in the Federal Society, blocked him three times last game, I think. A few times. Yeah, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Josh. Uh, five minutes, Professor Griffin. Thank you. And then Professor Griffin. Thank you so much. Uh, it's so good to be here. It's my first time at UNLV. I was in Las Vegas years ago. I wasn't quite 21. This is a very nice trip. I have to see Brittany tonight, so this is a very well, well, well worth it uh, to see. Then the red eye over class tomorrow morning. Uh, very typical Vegas night. Uh, so our topic today is collective liberty, and I'm grateful that they invited me to talk about this. I wrote a paper on this some years ago. Um, the story of our Constitution is a tale of two liberties, individual freedom and collective freedom. The inherent tension between these two is well known. Judicial protection of individual liberty inhibits the collective from freely arranging society through the democratic process. In contrast, judicial protection of this collective freedom to structure society may infringe on individual liberty, especially for those outside of the mainstream. This dynamic is particularly true of the First Amendment's guarantees of free speech and free exercise the topic for us today. With respect to free speech, there's a never-ending struggle between the protection of speech and the state's efforts to police the social costs of those expressions. And for the freedom of exercise, this balance is struck between the state's efforts to even-handedly apply the law and still respect individual conscience. For these rights, depending who and when you ask, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Like a pendulum over the last century, they have swung between the individual and the collective. Free speech started as a collective right that was protected so long as majoritarian politics deemed and promoted the goals of society. But soon, this right evolved to one of individual liberty, where speech was protected for its own sake, not because it served any higher democratic goals, and often it was anti-establishment. Think of the flag burning or the, uh, the draft card burning cases. But because the value of speech outweighed its negative externalities. Yet in recent years, as fears of the harm from dangerous speech have grown with the college campuses across the country, this pendulum is in the precipice of swinging back to what I call collective speech. The freedom of exercise has fallen through a more complicated trajectory, yet it winds up in a similar position. Five decades ago, free exercise emerged to protect religious minorities from a democratic process that did not sanction and indeed impose a substantial burden on their beliefs. Think of the Amish or the Seventh-day Adventists or Jehovah's Witness. But this pendulum 
eventually swung to the other side. When the Supreme Court held that it was up to the political process to provide special protections for, uh, for specific faiths, not the First Amendment. This is, of course, unemployment division versus Smith, Justice Scalia's opinion. But that same political process quickly tugged the pendulum back to the individual through the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which provided that free exercise religion could not be substantially burdened, even though it was a law of general applicability. However, pendulum swings. As the government reached further into the arms of faith, the beneficiaries of this law tended, I'm sorry, trended away from minority faiths like Jehovah's Witness to those of mainstream faiths, Christians. So here we are today where the robust protections of free exercise that recently enjoyed overwhelming support is poised to swing back when you have corporations like Hobby Lobby or perhaps bakers of cakes are asserting those rights as a shield against various laws concerning reproductive health, anti-discrimination. So now, where are we? I think the pendulum is swinging. That faith is protected so long as it does not interfere with the state's broader goals of equality and social justice. And this is why the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, which we were talking about today, is such a perfect instance. Here you have bakers who make cakes. And in their faith, they are quite devout. No one questions their sincerity. They're willing to serve same-sex couples, to make them a birthday cake or a Christmas cake or whatever else, but they won't do one specific thing, make a custom cake for a same-sex union. The state of Colorado has a law, like many states do, that prohibits places of public accommodation, bakeries, right, from discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation. So if this was a normal business without any religious beliefs, they would be guilty, right? They would be liable for civil damages. But here we have a religious bake, and they raised two separate claims. I've got a minute left, I'll wrap up. They raised two separate claims. First, they raised speech. This is a, based on what's called the compelled speech doctrine, that you can't force me to engage in a speech act, that you can't force me to salute the flag or stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I can take a knee if I wish, right? Like a current hip. Um, they also raise a free exercise claim. They argue that even though Colorado does not have a RIFRA, they still have a First Amendment, and this law is not of general applicability. That is, if I walk into a baker and I wanted to say, okay, saying, gay weddings are sinful, the baker could turn that person away. But if you do the exact mirror image, you walk in saying, I want a cake for a gay wedding, that gave rise to liability. So this case is brought both under the free speech clause and the free exercise clause. And let me tell you, this is a tough case. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. This is to be, I think, a very, one way or the other, whatever opinion yields, it's going to be a very tough opinion to write. Uh, so I will stop here, I'm right on schedule, and turn it back to our dear moderator, and uh, we will we'll move on from here. Professor Griffin. Thank you. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the current conflict between liberty and equality, which we think of as fundamental constitutional values. And one of the reasons that we have this conflict now is because of what our long history to protect people against discrimination, right? Whether we start with slavery or move to race or move to gender and now to sexual orientation. And it's important to remember that those moves to give people protection against discrimination come from their serving a long history of not being treated equal. And so they have a long history of not enjoying equality in the United States. And the hope is that with the passage of anti-discrimination laws, the country will finally get to the point of treating all these groups equally, which is a fundamental right that they're supposed to enjoy under the US Constitution. Now, of course, in many of those anti-discrimination cases, the biggest opponents of equality, whether race equality or gender equality or sexual orientation equality, have been the world's religions. If you look in particular at the history of women's equality, you'll find now that the biggest opponents of women's equality in the country are the nation's religions. And what they're claiming is any way they can that their liberty 
should free them, even though they've lost for now the anti-discrimination legislation law battle. That religious liberty means that they don't have to cooperate in any way with those anti-discrimination laws. And so we've seen that in the history of women, right? Where the goal of the Affordable Care Act was supposed to be that everybody gets the same insurance. But the religious employers said, even if our employees want that coverage, we are not going to give it to them. And why did they win? Because we have the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, right? Which is a much more demanding standard than the current free exercise clause, right? The current free exercise clause says everybody has to follow neutral laws of general applicability. But the Religious Freedom Restoration Act puts actions to stricter scrutiny. And so you see that the real battle between equality and liberty is usually between people who are fighting to get their basic equality under the Constitution but are facing opposition even after they win it. And so even after they get the legislation passed, even after <coughs> gender discrimination is protected against law. And now even though sexual orientation discrimination is protected in the law and same-sex marriage is legal, what's the response? The response is from the religious group saying, we still want to do what we don't have to do, what we, you know, anything we can not to support those weddings. You know, my own different view of it is that allowing numerous religious uh, freedom from the law is really going to undermine anti-discrimination law in the long run. That our public accommodation laws should mean that everybody has to follow the same law. And uh, we'll talk about that in a few minutes when we talk about the Masterpiece Law case. But if you really want to have anti-discrimination laws, you can't <coughs> keep undermining them with religious freedom claims. If you do that, liberty will eventually undermine equality. And the news for everyone is that everybody's supposed to get equality, right? It's not supposed to be something that can be undone by other people's religious beliefs. Thank you. I don't know if I'll be directly responsive to uh, these folks or to the question at hand, but uh, here's some deep thoughts maybe with uh, Professor Bart. Um, when, I, when I was a, when I was a Baby law professor about 10 years ago at, at Drake Law School in Des Moines, Iowa. Right about that time, uh, Iowa, the Iowa Supreme Court, had recognized state constitutional right to same-sex marriage. Uh, and Iowa is one of the states that has a state-level anti-discrimination law that includes sexual orientation as a protected class. And, and so, almost immediately, various groups of academics began to come into the state, send letters, petition the state legislature to try to get them to include pretty broad exemptions in whatever the, the same-sex marriage act is going to be for folks that had religious objections. And these uh, proposed exemptions uh, sort of caught, covered a, a spectrum. Uh, some folks thought maybe just exemptions for churches and their bona fides, like uh, you know, schools, etc. cetera. Uh, the other end, uh, religious exemptions for everybody, from churches to businesses, to the town clerks who didn't want to issue the marriage licenses. At the time, I wrote a kind of a short piece on this in which I said uh, the extreme ends of the spectrum I thought were pretty easy cases. <laughs> clearly, churches had to be exempt. Clearly, town officials couldn't be exempt. But the hard case for these middle, middle ground cases, uh, the businesses, uh, and I said at that time, naively, I didn't think that many of those actual cases would arise because, after all, who wants a disapproving chef to cater their, their happy day. Right? But turns out there are more people that, that wanted to bring that case than I, than I thought. And there have been a number of uh, sort of manifestations of that. Um, and, and so, because, uh, uh, as we've talked about, RIFRA uh, has not succeeded in, in getting new state-level RIFRAs in the last couple of years, that political battle has sort of been lost. Uh, in the courts, we have seen the emergence of this free speech kind of an argument. Uh, where the religious protection seems, if you can't, if you can't win the battle Josh is talking about, where you say it's not a law, a general law, then you're kind of out of luck on the religion argument. So the speech argument has come in, which basically says that this is uh, just another kind of a viewpoint, or that I can't be compelled to give a viewpoint. Uh, and it's sort of ironic, I think, that you now can probably get more protection for a religious view or religious belief as a matter of plain old speech than you can as religion as, as such. But that's, that's sort of the state of affairs uh, that, we're, that we're in. 
Um, I would say quickly, I'm coming off when I'm done, this is not the first time that the First Amendment has been sort of doubled back on itself like this. Uh, and, and in particular, in Establishment Clause doctrine, there's been sort of a, a longer battle over what it remain, means to remain neutral on, on religious matters for the state. And I have sort of called the two sides of that battle either inclusivist or exclusivist neutrality. A lot of people call them uh, accommodationist or strict separationist. But the basic idea is that some folks think the way to be neutral is to exclude all religious or all religion from the public square. We treat them all equally by excluding them all. And some people think the way is to invite everybody into the public square. Uh, the problem is that both sides think the other side is, is wrong, right? The exclusivists think that inclusive religion forces the government to support religious groups, and that this uh, takes away, through tax collection, my choice to not support a religious group. Uh, the inclusivists think that excluding all religious groups is not neutral at all, right? That it actually establishes a secular uh, or other viewpoint at the, at the expense of all others. So this battle's been going on, and as the exclusivists kind of had the better of it for a while, inclusivists began to turn to free speech doctrine again, to say, when you exclude religious viewpoints from the public square, you are actually engaging in viewpoint discrimination under the free speech clause. Right? So in a line of cases from Widmar v. Vincent, uh, Lamb's Chapel, Rosenberger v. Virginia, um, most recently maybe Good News Club v. Milford, uh, the court has accepted that rationale. For example, in Good News, uh, a school that opened its gymnasium to community groups after hours had to open it to a sort of a Sunday school group as well. Um, so this is not the first time this has sort of happened, this kind of conflation. My concern has, has all along been that, that these sort of conflations, speech as religion, religion as speech, tend to, at the level of first principles, uh, reduce the sacred to the secular, right? That they tend to, to treat religious speech as simply another version of secular speech. And is there a danger in that? I'm not sure. I think maybe the most acute version of this we see is actually an establishment doctrine over religious displays on public land where uh, for years to avoid the so-called endorsement test, uh, advocates of religious displays have said, oh, they're not actually religious. Right? They don't actually have religious meaning. Right? Most recently, the cross in Mojave Desert, uh, the court actually says this is not primarily, this Latin cross, a Christian symbol. Uh, cross gets to stay up, but I would just say, I don't think that's a victory for religious folks. Uh, and does the same danger lurk in these conflations of speech and religion that we're talking about in these cases today? I'm not sure. I don't know if it does or not. But I do think it's sort of wrong at the level of first principles, at least in this regard. Part of the promise of religious freedom is not only to protect the state from sort of the uh, dogmatic views of religion and religious rationales, it's also to protect religion from the sort of corrupting potential influence of the state and politics. And if we begin to conflate these things, uh, if the sacred, in fact, becomes nothing more than another secular political viewpoint, then I think we do, at least at the level of first principles, run the risk of being poor stewards of the uh, religious freedom promise. So I'll stop there. All right, thank you so much. Um, and so just for a quick refresher for maybe some of those who haven't read up on the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, uh, I thought I would lay out a kind of a classic law school fact the facts, relevant facts. Um, in July 2012, a same-sex couple decided to get married in Massachusetts. Uh, it was not yet legal in Colorado, and a burger fellow didn't go through until 2015. So on returning to Colorado, uh, I believe that Charlie Craig and David Mullins uh, decided they wanted to celebrate their union, and they went to Masterpiece Cake Shop. The owner of Masterpiece Cake Shop was Jack Phillips, and he uh, refused to make a cake for their union, but offered to sell them any other cake that was already in his shop. Uh, the couple then left. They went to another cake shop and received a cake for free for their celebration. And then they filed a civil suit against Masterpiece Cake Shop. Uh, the Colorado courts found for the plaintiffs, and they found that Masterpiece Cake Shop had violated Colorado's uh, Anti-Discrimination Act, which prohibits discrimination for uh, businesses that offer services to the public on the basis of sexual orientation, religion, race, or am I missing anything there? I feel like I'm missing something. Um, and they, in their court order, they said that uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop would have to change its company policies, provide comprehensive staff training regarding public accommodations to discrimination, and provide quarterly reports for the next two years regarding steps it has taken to come into compliance and whether it has turned away any prospective customers. 
Um, Jack Phillips, instead of complying with the court order, decided to close shop and then uh, petitioned to the Supreme Court for uh, uh, whether this was a violation of his First Amendment rights. And so the Supreme Court is going to look at Masterpiece Cake Shop and to see whether it applying Colorado's public accommodations law to compel the petitioner to cre create an expression that violates his sincerely held religious beliefs about marriage, violates free speech, or the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. Um, I think we'll turn it back over to the panel, kind of the same format, take on the case. We'll go same order. So um, I'll, I'll focus more on the free speech issues. Maybe it's a Griffin will talk about religion issues more. Um, the primary question here is the line of cases concerning compelled speech. And you've probably studied in the First Amendment a couple cases, one called Gobitis and another called West Virginia v. Barnett. And these cases involve uh, students in public schools who are of Jehovah's Witness faith. And part of their tenets is that they cannot salute the flag. That basically goes against their religious beliefs. And in a case called Gobitis, the court actually ruled that you could punish a student who refused to salute the flag. I'm not just talking saying they actually would salute it. That it, it basically looks like a Nazi salute. That's what they do. They would salute the flag. That was a tradition back then. That precedent didn't stand very long. And a couple of years later, the court reversed itself in a case called West Virginia v. Barnett. And there's a great opinion by Justice Robert Jackson beautiful opinion. And he says if there's any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it's that you can't force someone to uh, uh, engage in, in a speech that they don't believe in, paraphrasing a little bit here. Um, and that was a pretty uh, 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 basic foundation of our First Amendment law. And there was another case back some 30 years ago which involved New Hampshire. Now, you may know the state motto of New Hampshire is live free or die, right? That's their state motto. Um, it's printed on their license plates. Now, let's say you're a pacifist and you don't want such a violent message on your car, right? Well, could the government make you put on a bumper sticker? No, they can't. Can you put a little piece of tape or something over your license plate to cover up that message? The Supreme Court said, that's fine, because you can't be forced to express a message on behalf of the government, right? So let me give you an easy case, right? Let's say a Ku Klux Klan member walks into a print shop and says, I want you to print uh, my Nazi racist propaganda. Right, literally, freedom of the press, right? Printing press. Um, I think probably everyone in this room would say, that's okay, you can't force someone to uh, uh, actually print out this sort of Nazi propaganda, right? Someone asked me, Josh, you write books. Can you write me a book about why Adolf Hitler was a great guy? I'd say, yeah, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm turning away a paying customer, right? But making someone engage in speech that they don't like in an explicit form like a book or a printing press or a pamphlet is an easier case. This case, I think, is tougher because we're not talking about the printed word or the spoken word. We're talking about flour right, and sugar and water. And specifically what's going on here is that this couple walks into a, a bakery and say, hey, we want you to make us a cake for our, for our same-sex wedding. And you can read the record. The entire exchange lasted a few seconds, right? They said, I'm sorry, I can't do this, right? Once it became clear to the bakery, uh, sort of the baker, that this was a cake to be used for a, a same-sex union, he's like, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Um, and there are cases just like this with florists, right? There was a case from Washington, Arlene's Flowers, where this woman had been serving a gay couple for years, making them flowers for all manner of occasions, and they had a close relationship. The couple walks and said, hey, you know, Gay marriage is legal now, we're gonna get married. And she's like, I'm so sorry, I'll make you anything but not a wedding bouquet. And she said, here, let me give you the names of florists who will help you out, okay? You have these cases of the photographers, right? There's a case called, uh, was it uh, Elaine Photography, right? Arlene Flowers, Elaine Photography, they always, always confuse me. So you have Elaine Photography, and they say, hey, we want you to come to our wedding in New Mexico, and we want you to photograph it, and take pictures of the ceremony and everything else. I think these are Professor Bartram's middle of the road issues where it, it, this is not like a case like, sorry, I won't prepare the taxes of a gay, of a, you know, a, 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 I won't do the tax return for a married couple that's two men. I won't, you know, that's probably an easy case, right? Or we won't make a church force them to hold the gay wedding, right? These are these middle of the road cases that are tougher. So specifically with the bake case, we have to ask one question. Is baking a cake an act of speech? And this is a litigated issue. This is not like a, uh, uh, there's not like a case law in this necessarily one way or the other. 
So the baker says that our cakes are masterpieces, right? That's the name of the bake shop, right? It's a masterpiece. And every cake that I make is an act of expression. I put my heart and soul into the fondant and the flour and the sugar. I, I can't make a Betty Crocker cake. I have no idea what I'm doing. But in theory, right? Uh, uh, if you're making this, you bring a lot of artistry into it. And the other side says, no, it's not. You're just baking flour, sugar, and water. And we start ascribing the, the sacred to the secular, right? I, think, I like that phrase you used. If we start making the sacred secular, we say, it's a freaking cake, right? You mix some flour and water and sugar. Does that degrade what actually is valuable speech? I think, I think it's a fair point Professor Bartram raised a minute ago. Um, let's say I'm right. Let, let, let's say that the, this cake is an act of free speech. Okay, then we go to the much harder question. Is making someone make a cake compelled speech? In other words, there's no message on the cake, right? If the cake said at the top in frosting, God bless a burger film, right? Thank God for gay marriage, right? You know, an actual message. Anthony Kennedy's a saint for giving us gay marriage, right? St. Anthony, right? You get St. Patrick, maybe St. Anthony's say, right? That, I think, would be an easier case because you're making them write a message. But just a regular cake without two groomsmen on the top, just a regular cake, three tiers, whatever it is, is that speech. Another question. When you make a cake, you're not going to the wedding, right? You make the cake in your own kitchen, you hand it over to them, and they deliver it, and they put it up at their wedding. How are you associated with a party that you're never going to, right? Will anyone who even looks at the cake even know that you are the baker behind it? I don't know, maybe they try and you know, tag you on Instagram or something, or maybe, maybe that will happen. But how does actually making the cake associate you with the wedding? I think actually the photographer is a much easier case because you actually have to go to the ceremony, participate, line people up, take pictures, and like, oh, okay. But the, the cake is being made in a bakery, which I think is actually a fairly significant fact. It's removed from the wedding. All right, so let's say you actually, the cake is speech, and let's say making the cake is then associated with the ceremony. I think the final question is, what's the balance? Right, the Colorado people through their legislature enacted this discrimination law that says if you're a common carrier, that is you have a place of public accommodation, if someone comes into your store, offers you whatever the, whatever the price, whatever the going rate is, you have to serve them. You can't turn them away. And I think Professor Griffin's right. It does have a, a social cost to have people know that if I go to a certain bakery, I'm gonna be turned away. And I can't know when I walk into a store if they're actually been serving. That's a legitimate cost. Um, there's also the cost, I think, to the couples. Um, now, I haven't done the numbers on this, but how many bakers in the Denver area are unwilling to make cakes for gay weddings? I'm guessing the number is probably pretty small, right? I'm guessing it's a small number. Uh, these cases have arose, but I think they're probably rarer than you think. Um, most incorporated bakeries, you know, at a Walmart or whatever, Target, that make cakes, they'll, they'll, they'll do it. They don't really care. But these are the small two, three, four, five person businesses who are or here. Now, if this was a matter of legislation, right, and Professor Barcher mentioned legislation in Iowa, maybe we could just craft an easy rule that says, if your shop has less than 10 employees, we'll give you a general carve out. And in fact, under federal discrimination law, Title VII doesn't really apply to small businesses, right? If you have a small business, mm -hmm. you're not bound by federal discrimination law. State law, maybe, but not federal. Maybe the easy rule is, if you're that small, you're a mom and pop bake shop, look, we'll, we'll let you out. But that's not what we have here. The law here applies. So here, I think you then have to ask very, very clearly, are we willing to use the First Amendment to carve out exceptions? And if we give it to the baker, photographer, florist, DJ, right? What if you want to be a DJ or a band? Making party favors, right? An accountant who won't do a, a return for a same-sex couple. A family lawyer, right? You guys will be lawyers in a couple years, right? A family lawyer who won't do domestic law for a same-sex couple, right? A clerk in a county court who declines to issue licenses uh, to same-sex couples. A judge who declines to perform a same-sex wedding, which is why I'm telling you this case is really hard, right? It's, it's not just about bakeries. Um, the photography case, the one from New Mexico, a, a, a lady's photography, this went up to the court about maybe three or four years ago, before Burger fell, and the court denied certiorari, because they're like, we're not touching this yet, right? But now, I think they actually have to touch it. 
And you know, we have Kennedy. He's always our, our he's our overlord. He's our despot, right? We, 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 he decides who lives and dies. He decides who gets married and can't get married. He makes all the decisions for them. What, what, what do we know? I don't know. Do you have a prediction as to what Justice Kennedy would do? This case, I don't. In my, in my view, he's the swing. Like he's. I, I really don't know. I think side, Kennedy so. has a sore spot for First Amendment free speech. He really does. He really does. And another and Hobby Lobby, too. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, he voted Hobby Lobby, he voted Burgerfell. I, I really don't know. And, and I want to think about, like, if the, if the if this couple wins, right? Let's just say, I'll, I'll give, how much time do I have? About two minutes? I'll, I'll finish up with this, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm that good. No, that's fine. I'll, I'll wrap up here. So I think there are two possibilities, right? The baker wins, right? What does the opinion look like? Just imagine you're a law clerk, right, for the justice, right, this opinion. As a general matter, Discrimination laws apply except when <laughs> blank, right? What do you fill that blank in with? That's a hard, I mean, that's a final exam question. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, like, just write me, just try and think through what sort of opinion do you write? Now, the other side, it's like, well, you can't be compelled to engage in free speech, but this is okay because blank, right? And then you have to think about the florist and the people writing KKK messages on their cake and, you know, you walk into a Jewish baker and you ask for a cake with an oven on top of it, right? Oh. It's true. These are the sorts of cases, the borderline cases that whatever decision happens here follows up. Uh, I don't. I I usually have a good sense. This case, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm really uncertain what's going to happen. Here. Thank you. <laughs> well, I will talk briefly about the free exercise clause. Uh, may he rest in peace. Justice Scalia wrote that great Employment Division B. Smith decision, which most people don't like, so I understand if everybody in the room likes it, but it said that what everybody has to follow due to laws of general applicability, and that was viewed as a change from the old First Amendment cases. But right now, in this case, because of Justice, Smith's, uh, of Justice Scalia's opinion in Smith, people think, oh, it's going to be really hard to win this case under free exercise. And since Smith, that has been true, right? It's, if the law of the religion clauses is now everybody must follow the neutral laws of general applicability, then occasionally you have a case like Kumi, where what you can look at what the state was doing and saying, oh, they intentionally singled out the Santeria of religion for disfavored treatment. And such discrimination against religion is a violation of the First Amendment. But what, asking everybody to follow neutral laws. So even a cake baker who doesn't believe in, in free marriage on religion grounds, the law of the free exercise clause seems to say everybody has to follow that law. Now, despite that, right, you know that in response to Smith, we've gotten religious freedom restoration acts, which in a way the court can kind of say, oh, we're not applying the free exercise clause now. We're applying a statute that requires strict scrutiny. And so you've got the federal government held to strict scrutiny and some states that have religious freedom restoration acts, but not the state. And so in the religion perspective, it's kind of different because you can't win the free exercise clause and you don't have a RIFRA to help you. It's a completely different case if you have a state RIFRA, right? It would be more now kind of arguing what does the state RIFRA do? And so uh, now in the briefs though, there are people still seeking to change Smith, right? Because Smith has been an unfortunate decision to many people for many years. And so the briefs are suggesting to the court new ways to what? Move away from the neutral law of general applicability rule and somehow get stricter scrutiny, meaning the government will have a higher burden to meet and it will be harder to pass a law like this. So technically uh, the court, what, you know, could, could say this is a religion case, but right now, I mean, to me, it looks like all the religion arguments that you used to get just moved over to free speech. And now it's, we want a free speech exemption. And the old fashioned way of saying that is since we passed the Civil Rights Act, the rule has been that public accommodation laws apply to everybody and we don't give out exemptions here and there. Um, if you read some of the briefs on this and some of the articles, this is just bacon and cake. It's not a whole expressive speech thing. And the danger is if the cake baker wins this, all the examples that you talked about could follow. It's hard to say this, this would just be an exception for a case baker. So, uh, so my own view is that, well, anti-discrimination laws, the rule that we've set up is the way to protect the people who have belong discriminated against is to say now you have to treat them.
and it doesn't matter if it's against your religion or not. If it's really against your religion, you could go out of business. But if you're going to do business, everybody plays by the same rules. Otherwise, you wind up with a religion-based business with some people doing this and some people doing that. And my own view is that it's very hard to ask gay people to choose which baker will serve them when they're supposed to now enjoy equality under the anti-discrimination laws. So, uh, um, you know, uh, I see the I, I see the tension uh, uh, should be resolved for the same-sex couples, but um, you know, it's up to Justice Kennedy. <laughs> I'll just quickly point out sort of two possible slippery slopes, I think, in this, what everybody said. One is <clears throat> between conduct and speech, right? So uh, to me, uh, at the first glance, this is providing goods and services. Um, that's conduct, right? That's off the top of my head, right? We already compel lots of kinds of conduct as in <coughs> providing goods and services. Um, the, the test when you're talking about whether something's expressive conduct is whether person intends a specific message in their conduct and whether it's likely to be understood right as a specific message what does that mean is baking a cake likely to be understood as expressing some kind of specific message of support for the gay I don't know right but it's a slippery slope because uh, if it's baking a cake then it could be all these other things right uh, is doing someone's taxes expressing support for their for their union um, my own view is that it's not expressive content that it's not likely to be understood as a specific kind of a message. But, uh, you know, as you said, Kennedy's a sore spot for freedom of expression, and that uh, could be wrong. The other slippery slope I see is in the sort of thing that you have an objection to. So right now it's same-sex marriage, and it's a new thing on the, on the horizon, and, you know, we can sort of understand how people have this religious objection to same-sex marriage. It seems like something people might object to, but I don't see the line between that and just not serving gay people generally, because they're gay, and you have a religious objection to people being gay. I don't know where that line gets drawn, uh, but I think the further and further you get down the road of people being able to decide what exactly, sincerely, uh, I find objectionable as a religious matter, uh, the more and more dangerous uh, our sort of uh, equality principle, uh, the more dangerous our equality principle is. So I'll just stop there. Um, none of you mentioned the amazing brief of just photograph. I was kind of which, brief, which brief was this? One of the briefs for Masterpiece Cake Shop is exclusively photographs of artistic cakes that have been made. Oh, right. Yeah. There's no wording on it whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just ask you this. Though. So, so this is an interesting thing for the, for the conduct part. Like, So I assume that they're told what they want the cake to look like. Right? I don't make cakes. I don't know. But really, sometimes they probably give it freedom, and that's it. But you can have your cake and eat it too, is what you're saying. Well, what I mean, like, <laughs> is it compelled speech? I'm sorry. I went to the Paris last time. The very, very bright red mode. But when I tell you I'm, I want my cake to be uh, that looks, it's going to be this waterfall, and, and I think that's hard. It's going to be horrifically ugly. What you I don't want to be associated with that. Am you know, I nonetheless being compelled to speak when I uh, fulfill their order? Can I say no? I'm not making that cake. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I'd love to open it up for any questions. Please, yes, we... question. Thank you. Yeah. Or Mark. Uh, one question on this case specifically, or how it would branch out, and I don't know enough of the background other than what's been in the mainstream media, which also is a bad word. But uh, so my question on this though is, will the court likely also look at the consistency of a religious argument? And what I mean by that is, so this individual shop did not want to customize a cake for same-sex marriage due to their religious, I'm guessing, Christian faith. Maybe it's a dangerous guess, but I'm guessing. Um, but I would wonder, would it matter if they've also turned away birthday parties in the past for children out of wedlock? They don't make Halloween cakes. They get more of devil worship. Okay, but do you, uh, that's, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. but, uh, no, they're, they're actually, actually, I don't know about that, that, that un illegitimate children, I should have looked at it, but I know they don't make Halloween cakes. What I mean, though, is do you think, though, that the court, the Supreme Court, though, would, would also look at that? Is, is there a consistency to their so, claim? So, so um, in the First Amendment context, courts will assess sincerity, right? Do you sincerely hold beliefs? They won't question what the tenets of your doctrine are. So perhaps in their faith, children of unmarried parents are children of God, and they should be celebrated the same. This baker, I can tell you, they think that Halloween is a Satan worshiping holiday, and they will not make Halloween treats. So that answers the question of God, yeah. I suppose. So, but, but it does raise the question yeah. of what 
comes after the apron, right? If the cake baker's win, yes. Then a lot of people are going to be trying a lot of things. So I think it opens the door. Mama, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that the court and that are the people going to be drawing a distinction somewhere. So where are the possibilities of, of what criteria or, or what are the possibilities that they might choose? Okay, very good question. So if you read the, um, the lower court opinion from the Colorado Supreme Court, they basically punt and say, well, this is not expression. Making a cake is not expression. That's an easy line, right? We simply say that baking flour, water, sugar is not expression. The First Amendment is inapplicable. That, it's got it, right? Yeah, that, 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 that's an easy case. But I, I don't see them drawing that line because look at the, the, the Photoshop, you know, the book. So um, perhaps they could have some sort of what is Kennedy? Some sort of squishy balancing test, right? That that will make your law students crazy. We have to write it on an exam, <laughs> where it's like you know, if the if, if, if the belief substantially burdens the you know artistry, I don't I don't know. I, I that when I said before fill in the blank, I meant it. I don't know what the blank is. I think it's a hard case to write, uh, one way or the other. Maybe maybe my colleagues have better I, ideas. I, I think the line is where it is in conduct, which is that the message is intended to convey a specific message, uh, and whether it's the conduct is intended to convey a specific and it's likely to be understood that way. So that, uh, you know, when you make the cake, right, if you're writing on the cake, it conveys a specific message to be understood. You put an oven on the Jewish cake, probably intending a specific message, likely to be understood that way, okay? If you're asking to bake me a generic cake for my uh, wedding, I have difficulty seeing that being understood as as expressive conduct. So to me, that makes a, a, a nice, clean line. That's not bad. Yeah, um, but I could be wrong. Does it change that a pride flag was put on the, the second cake? That might be closer, right? Under that under that rationale, you say, look, that is a specific intent. You know, there's a message there, and it's likely to be understood that way. That becomes expressive conduct. And if I'm, I mean, on my line, yes. Frank, I actually did used to work at a bakery, and we turned away. Uh -huh. Cakes all the time because well, really? they were stupid, not delicious. Yeah, <laughs> but like, give me an example. Like, give me so, an example of what you would turn so away. The, so we, the waterfall was funny because somebody requested a uh, unicorn, and just the way the fondant would have to be on the horn didn't didn't work. It but, didn't work. Yeah, but it was. I mean, it was never reasons for it. But my question is, when you, it seems like like you said, this is extremely messy. If you could vary the hypo a little bit, if it was an atheist bake shop. Or just an agnostic bake shop. Right. Take religion out of it, and you just did the, the the expression or the freedom of speech part of it. Uh -huh. Do you think it would, it would be easier to decide if somebody just came in and said, "I want, you know, I want a gay marriage cake," and be like, "No, well, you can't discriminate. Well, I just don't want to do the cake." Because when you bring up the Halloween thing, then it's interesting. If what if a Satanist went in? <clears throat> Right, and wanted a Halloween cake. Six, six, six cake, right? Or whatever it would be. I mean, it, it, I, I, I've read about this case and failed to see why it necessarily has to be a religion thing. It's probably not. I, th I think. No, I think your question's right. And in fact, we work in a bakery. He's giving us a little bit of a, a little bit of insight into this. Um, if this is a pure free speech case, it's a lot easier. When you get to the First Amendment exercise ground, it gets a lot messier. I think you used the right word. Um, if we just say that you can't be. If we just say that. Baking a cake of any sort is expressive conduct. And under the flag saluting case, you can't be forced to engage in expressive conduct. That's actually an easy opinion to write. And I suppose they could write in such a way to lump in florists and maybe photographers, but not <coughs> accountants and you know tax preparation, right? Maybe that's the opinion you could write. Um, but, but even then, I think Professor Griffin's points are fair. You are now carving out a fairly broad swath of the anti-discrimination law, right? This is not Dude, I'm not making your ugly unicorn cake so it looks stupid, right? It's not gonna work. The, the horn, you can't make it. This is, I'll make a cake for Adam and Eve, but not for Adam and Steve, right? It's specifically because of the nature of the union going to. Thank you for the question. Let's say the court decides that there is no Well, so first of all, this is actually not a case brought by the couple. It's brought by the Colorado Human Rights Commission. So it's actually the government prosecuting. But the second point, which Professor Griffin mentioned earlier, Hobby Lobby was brought into RIFRA, this federal statute that provides additional layer of protection for free exercise. This is a state case. They don't have RIFRA in Colorado. Uh, I should note that the Elaine photography case was in New Mexico. New Mexico had a RIFRA, and they still lost. And the reason why is in New Mexico they said that the RIFRA cannot be applied 
as a defense for a discrimination claim. This is actually a very vigorous debate, and there's a, I've written about this, a pretty big circuit split on this, right? Some state RIFRAs, and even some federal RIFRAs and circuits have said, if you're sued for discrimination, you can raise RIFRAs as a defense. So I'll give you an example. There's a case from, there's a second circuit case from either Connecticut or New York, where you had, a, I think it was the Episcopalian Church, and they, they had a mandatory retirement age, right? Now, generally, those are illegal. You can't force someone to retire at a certain age because that's age discrimination. But they actually raised RIFRA as a defense, saying, aha, right? I, this burdens our free exercise to keep these old priests around. So there was actually a majority opinion allowed the defense to be raised, and then Circuit Judge Sotomayor dissented, saying, no, 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 you can't use RIFRA as a shield like that, right? You can't use it. So even if RIFRA applies, it's not clear you can use it as a defense. Uh, but there's a, there's a really big split on this head. Won't be implicated here, but maybe we'll implicated elsewhere. Okay. What do you think are some of the long-term implications if the court finds in favor of the couple mm. for unintended consequences? You know, you mentioned before uh, Jewish cake shop having to bake in the oven for neo-Nazis. You know, what, what are some of the, the extremes that could possibly result from this as an unintended consequence being a broad? You want to talk about slippery slopes? I think you alluded to that earlier. Yeah, I, I'm less concerned about that because, um, you know, you retain the right to refuse goods and services to unprotected classes of people. Um, and so, uh, unless, you know, we have this uh, viewpoint discrimination. Uh, can I interject briefly? Um, some states protect political ideology. Well, and if you have that, yeah. then you have a much harder problem. Yeah. If you don't have a political ideology as a yeah. protected class, uh, then I think a lot of those things of making weird stuff simply don't fall under the indiscrimination law. Like if you have political ideology, then maybe it gets harder, right? Um, I still think, right, that you could use the conduct expression line to, to weed those cases out, to say, look, when you put the KKK cake, that's, there's, no, there's a specific intent, and it's likely to be understood. You can call that speech and protect compelled speech, um, and you can still deal with that problem. Given that they're making a First Amendment claim under speech and religion, mm -hmm. doesn't that sort of maybe take Smith out and make it more like Yoder? Because you're combining two rights? Well, yeah, Yoder, though, I don't know if Yoder's good law anymore. Right? I mean, that's the question. Did Smith overrule Yoder <coughs> and uh, Sherbert v. Verona? I think there's a probably did. I mean, Scalia didn't say that, but Scalia I, said it didn't. But, 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 right, so Scalia himself said that there are hybrid cases yeah. in which, which you combine free exercise yeah. <laughs> with another constitutional protection. And so yeah. what Smith itself, right, because Smith was controversial, but he ruled, made the ruling without overruling old cases and saying, oh, some of those earlier cases that won were hybrid cases, which combined free exercise with another constitutional right. And the circuit courts had all kinds of fun or no fun with the hybrid, kind of debating, yeah. is the hybrid good theory or not good theory? So, I actually, so right now it's not very good theory, and yet they're still arguing for it in this case. So there is an argument that this case involves a hybrid, and, and the hybrid under Smith so throw away everything I said about Smith following neutral laws of general applicability. If you're in a Smith hybrid, that is free X plus another constitutional right, then you would get to strict scrutiny and you'd be in your RIFRA situation and the standard would be, would be different. And so there is some hope in this case that the court could, what it hasn't done, the court could say, oh, we really believe in Smith hybrid. I mean, it doesn't seem very likely, but it's a way, another way that they're being asked to change First Amendment free in fact, Smith itself could have been a hybrid case, right? Mm -hmm. Because of that freedom of association and freedom of religion. So I, that's why I think the hybrid rationale, while convenient, is perhaps not. I, I'm actually litigating a hybrid case right now. 3D printed guns. Whoa. So the case follows my client, Cody Wilson, who put blueprints in the internet how to manufacture 3D printed guns. Hybrid. Free speech and the Second Amendment. I made that up. I was, I think I was the first person to figure that out. He hired me because of that. Uh, see, I actually wrote an article about this. He hired me because of it. Our server edition is pending now. So far, no judge has accepted my hybrid argument, but if I can make it work, I, I will make <laughs> hybrid rights great again. <laughs> so, my understanding is sexual orientation was expanded under the 64 Act by the EEOC. Not by a separate act of Congress. We may expand it. 
Uh, originally, my understanding was uh, the 64 Act, Title VII, or Title IX, or whatever it was, said you can't discriminate based on sex. And then 10 years later, the EEOC, I believe, not said we're going to extend it, not just you can't discriminate based on male or female, but also by orientation. But that, that was an EEOC ruling, not an expansion by Congress. And I, I don't know if any of these modern Supreme Court cases have specifically expanded anti-discrimination by creating gay couples as a protected class. So my question is, is there a possibility that the Supreme Court could actually go hard right on this and say gay or, or, or sexual orientation is actually not a protected class under an act of Congress and therefore doesn't apply? Um, this case does implicate federal law, so that's not this case, but I think what you're referring to is whether the Civil Rights Act of 64, which has phrase because of sex, <laughs> includes sexual orientation and even gender identity. And the Obama administration took several positions, both in EEOC memos and DOJ memos, saying it does. Some courts have went that way, some courts haven't gotten there yet, so this will probably trickle up. Uh, we don't need Congress anymore, we just need you know, updating statutes, as Judge Posner would say. Thank you, former Judge Posner. Maybe you have a long, healthy retirement. <laughs> All right, I think. Chris, uh, I wouldn't want you to forget that women continue to be discriminated yeah. against in many settings. And so if you have a victory for the cake bakers here, there's no reason why you can't have discrimination against other forms of wedding, like inter religious, intra religious weddings, uh, and different attitudes toward women. Once you open the door, it's not, you know, this is a gay case, but others see the There's a slippery slope. Here we go. Right, we have time? Right, tell us, there's a long history of discrimination. Yeah, we have, we have just a little bit of time. Okay. I'll hear as long as you want to be here. My show's not until 9, so I got, I got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Oh, David, you got one? Sorry. Yeah. So I'm wondering, um, you know, you I'm wondering if there have been any organizations comprised of chefs or, or whatever who have who have filed amicus briefs going either way on the on whether it is yeah. expression because I, I like I, I was reading um, a couple weeks ago the HRC had a gala in DC and had all these pastry chefs bring in all these amazing cakes and it's almost like they were using them as a form of expression you know so I'm wondering if pastry chefs have come out either way on it. I think HRC, correct me wrong, has a brief by Chef Andres, one of the other famous chefs, saying that this is not protected by the Constitution. <laughs> so uh, you also had, I think, another, if I remember this correctly, it was actually a gay couple who bakes who says that the baker should win here. So I mean, these sorts of briefs are, give me a good word. Well, we haven't, we haven't seen all the ones on the other side. Yeah. Either, so uh, they're still coming in. Yeah, they're still coming in. I, I don't put much weight in these briefs. Um, do I think that any of the bakers who signed these briefs have really thought about the constitutional question? <laughs> Probably not. They know what the bottom line is. They know which side they want to win. So when you see these briefs, this is a point not just for this case, but whenever you see a brief signed by hundreds or thousands of people, um, they didn't really write the brief. They didn't really read it. Probably, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know how much weight the, they have with the justices. Maybe they do. I don't know. I think it's, it's clear that like baking a cake can be expressive, Congress. <laughs> But I don't think it's always expressive kind of. You need frosting to get there? You need to write a message in frosting is that the right line? No, you can have other kinds of you know symbolism. But, uh, symbolism. but uh, you know, I think there's a line we have for that. Makes sense. Go ahead. Our baker. Yeah, we might lock through today, but we could go to another case. <laughs> we, rejected, we rejected a lot of requests for like uh, crude cakes, like lewd right. things like that. Like so, what? Penises. <laughs> so, so, but I'm saying it didn't require any the frosting, didn't require any expression. It was like it was intended, it was shaped this way. It was like bachelorette cakes and stuff? Yeah, and we rejected, I mean, also all. But you could clearly say that there was expression in that kind of thing. Right. <laughs> I was saying it doesn't require writing anything. Right. It doesn't require any. It doesn't require any. It doesn't have to be written. It requires no frosting. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. Next question. <laughs> no, we'll set it to. So this is because I've been watching way too much Halloween more. But there's also a point where the cake moved from being a cake to actually a piece of art. Like they're using cake material to create almost little statues. Is that the point where is that expressive? expressive? I think that's expressive. Yeah, I was just at Caesar's Palace. Have these these Roman statuettes? We make a Roman statuette cake, right? Yeah. It just doesn't last very long. Just follow the law. 
Um, <laughs> can, I, can you hold out for a minute? Yeah. Okay, Sorry, we're, we're running out of time. I can tell people are running away. If you have are here for a CLE, please leave your CLE paper in the back. Loma said she would be so kind as to take it up. Uh, just one last uh, quick plug for FedSoc. If you love what happened here today, like I did, want to be a part of this, uh, Simply go to fedslock.org slash join, $5 for the cheapest organization on campus, have the best events, um, and thank you for our panel.